So in the last video, we talked about an improvement to our model of silicon, or specifically our model of an electron in silicon. So originally we started with, well, we just got this block here. It's a block of silicon and there's an electron floating around in it, E minus. And it can move wherever it wants, but it cannot escape this box. And we added in then, uh, we said, well, that model turns out not to be sufficient. So we added in a bunch of positive bound charges that represent the atoms. And these positive charges stretch throughout all of three dimensional space. And we said we could model those charges as just a potential well. So because the, they tend to attract, uh, the positive charges tend to attract this negative electron there's a negative potential energy or a positive energy that the electrons must overcome to escape the pull of the well. And we said that this energy was u naught and this energy was zero, or you could say zero and minus u naught, it wouldn't, wouldn't matter either way. And this leads to what's called the chronic penny model. And typically, this is a graduate level material, so I'm not going to be covering the solution in depth. Uh, if you want, I can make a video on that, but it's I don't think it's a, a priority for really understanding how, how this stuff works. It's a lot of really complicated math, uh, basically. But essentially, it's just solving the Schrodinger equation, uh, plugging in u is equal to this u of x. And you might say, well, why did we use this sort of square wave type shape. Why didn't we use a more accurate one that involves like one over Rs? Uh, and the reason for that is that it would have been really, really complicated. Uh, the math involved in solving just this relatively simple potential function is incredibly complicated. Um, so it's, it's not very desirable to make the model unnecessarily complicated. Um, but the final result, so what we get out of the chronic penny model after we solve the Schrodinger equation is something that looks like this. So if this is the wave number k on the x-axis and this is the energy on the y-axis, we get something that looks like this. So this curve, uh, or these two curves that I'm drawing right now, uh, represent the allowed uh, allowed energy energy as a function of k. So, so remember in the last model we got a somewhat similar result. Um, the Remember that the energy was just within the well, within the box, the silicon box, was just h bar squared k squared divided by 2m. And here, uh, k could take the values uh, n times pi divided by l. So it could take any one of, of many, many values. And so you could write e as a function of n, but basically you'd get that there's a certain number of discrete points um, that e and k satisfy that the Schrodinger equation is solved for. And these states are allowed states. So this is for like, this is for K1, for K2, so N equals one, N equals two, and so on and so forth. And I've just drawn it, uh, drawn it symmetrically here. So we can allow for negative, negative K, uh, depending on how you, uh, if, if you solve things in terms of complex exponentials or in terms of just sine waves, you'll get only positive N or positive N negative N. It's just kind of easier to draw this way. So these dots will kind of follow the shape of a parabola because we see that the relationship between E and K is E is proportional to K squared. So we would expect the, the relationship to be a parabola. And so these allowed states determine how our electron kind of moves around. And if we've got a bunch of allowed states next to each other, say here we've got something like 20 and the curve is starting to look pretty continuous, but say we have millions and millions or uh, 10 to the 20 plus possible states, then 
this curve will start to look much more continuous. So rather than looking like a bunch of discrete points, it'll start to look like a continuous curve. And that's actually what we have over here. So we've got the same sort of relationship between energy and momentum. It looks kind of like a parabola uh, at first, and then it stops looking like a parabola, and we've got this interesting, interesting curvature. So we'd expect that for small energies, so for small deviations from, uh, for small, say, delta E, uh, small deviations from this energy near the bottom of this, this little band, we'd expect our results to be pretty similar uh, to the results for a, the electron in a box, at least in terms of the electron. Now, the really interesting part comes in that there's a second band here. There's a second curve. There's a bunch of other allowed states down here that electrons can occupy. And that wasn't at all predicted by our initial model, uh, by the free electron in a box type model. And it turns out that this band, uh, these two bands are nothing but the conduction band and the valence band that we described previously. So electrons, which are initially sitting down here in one of these quantum states, can jump up to the conduction band and they'll leave behind a hole or a positive state or a positive, uh, positive charge in an empty state. So this EK diagram actually describes everything that we wanted. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to go over how the how we can calculate things like the hole's mass uh, from this from this graph. But basically, this EK, uh, E as a function of K, and the relationship between energy and momentum, the energies and momentum that solve the Schrodinger equation, these are what actually gives rise to all the quantitative predictions that we can we can make about silicon. And the other cool thing about these EK curves is they can actually be comp computed numerically. So if you want a really, really precise uh, version of the chronic penny model, or say you want to account for things like electron-electron interactions and other, other things that we ignored in developing this model, if you want a really, really precise curve, uh, a really, really precise EK relationship, you can numerically solve the Schrodinger equation and then generate these curves for any semiconductor that you want. So if you understand the EK curve, and in the next video, I'm going to go over how do we actually interpret this curve. If you understand this, then you understand kind of the fundamentals of semiconductors. And out of this curve uh, arises the band model for solids, so the one that I briefly introduced uh, where we've got the conduction band and the valence band. And here, the x, the x coordinate is actually a spatial coordinate x instead of being momentum. But I'll describe sort of how we get this band model and then how we use it from the results of our EK curve.